Brian, I need you to do me a favor, if you would. Remind me. I'm sorry, y'all, to do this, but if I don't do it, I'll forget it. Remind me of something I need to send you before the next service. I just uh, felt like something the Lord wants me to do at the end of the next service. So there you go. God messing up my plans again. It's all right, isn't it? Man, it's definitely all right. Matter of fact, I was just kind of struggling with do I need to continue on, but I think I do because I think this is going to help some of you and some of, and and even me too, because we're we're all, I didn't plan on this, but so a few weeks ago I preached a sermon called On Your Marks. If you were here, you heard it. If not, hopefully you went online and watched it. And all our messages are online, and I hope that if, if there are Sundays when you're not here that you'll go online and and keep up with that because there's things that happen and are said that that you need to know about and sometimes you only get it in here um, but I challenge you guys to to run the race that God has called you to run specifically your race and this is for everybody this is truly for every child from the youngest to the oldest we all have something a specific thing that God is calling us to do a race Paul Paul called it, and, and, and it came from Philippians chapter 3, and there's other places he talked about it. And we read a little bit of this when we started the service. This comes from verse 13 in chapter 3. It says, One thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And, and Paul equates it to running a physical race. Like some of you guys I know are run, maybe are runners or you used to be runners or whatever or you like to compete in a sport or whatever, but he, he equated it to the, the games that they, they had, like the Olympic games, and that they're in a race everybody runs to win. Everybody wants to win. Nobody gets in a race thinking, well, I'm just going to lose. I'm just going to run anyway because I know I'm going to lose. But they all run in competition to win. And when you get down to the end, he says, be leaning forward, pressing towards the mark, that, that finish line. We're all coming to a finish line. Are you all awake today? Is it too early? We're all coming to a finish line. And it may be that your finish line is 60 years down the road, and that's awesome. It may be that your finish line is really close, and some of you are going, I, I think I can see the tape from here. It's so close, right? And, but, but either way straining, pressing forward, leaning into it. When you watch these guys run in the Olympics or whatever, when they get to the finish line, what do they do? They just lean a little bit more to try to beat that guy, to get there. That's what Paul's talking about. And today when I talk, what I want to talk about, the last time we talked about it was kind of getting on your marks, getting in the, in the place to re- get ready to run the race. Well, now we need to get set to run the race. Y'all remember, right, as kids, it was on your marks, get set, and... Go. Okay. So you know what's coming next week, right? Okay. Just, just no surprises there. But today's about getting set. And what do we need to do to do that? If you weren't here Wednesday night, um, I issued a challenge to everybody, and, and it wasn't really planned, but it, it came from, uh, I had gotten an email from Uversion. Uversion is a Bible app that you can get on your phone or tablet or whatever. And I just got an email about a 21 day challenge. And I just issued it to the church. I said, what if we just all did that? Read our Bibles for 21 days. And you don't have to use the YouVersion app. You don't have to do that. But just read your Bible for 21 days. You know, take 10, 15, 20 minutes to read your Bibles for 21 days. And if all of us do that, I wonder what's going to happen in 21 days. It might be pretty awesome. Matter of fact, the the 21 days is going to end... I think it's really close to that Wednesday night, so I'm kind of expecting uh, that Wednesday night might be really special, so you might want to keep that in mind. But, but talking about running your race and getting set, see, God wants to prepare us to run our race. He doesn't just throw us out there and say, start running. Jesus didn't do that. He didn't do it with his disciples. John the Baptist was sent to prepare the way for Jesus. In Luke 1, it says, He will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the, wisdom to, of, to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. I think that's interesting, to make for the Lord a people prepared. And then in Matthew 3, it says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, 
a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Interesting, isn't it? I mean, we all know the story. You, you're, you, you all heard it. I know it's kind of boring, but that's kind of another sermon for another day. I don't know that we should be bored in church, but, but you've heard it before. He's preparing the way for the Lord to come do his ministry, and he did. But you know, Jesus is also coming back. He's coming back. And that's what this time is all about, being prepared for him coming back. Matthew 24 says, Therefore you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. There's all kinds of scriptures about that. The, the parable of the virgins, you know, and didn't have their oil ready, and some did, some didn't. And we just kind of go, I mean, those are just weird stories. But the fact is, if you're a follower of Christ and you have any knowledge of the Bible, you know that it's clear that he is coming back. And he's coming back to get his people, his bride, he called it. And he wants his bride, his people, to be spotless and blameless. And that's us. If you're a follower of Christ, so we need to be prepared. What if he came back today? Seriously, there's really nothing stopping him that I can see. He could come back before I finish this sentence. I mean, there could be a loud boom and a flash, and hopefully all of us would be gone, in my opinion. And we don't have to argue that point today. We're not, we're not getting into that discussion. But he could come back like now. Are you ready? Are you prepared for him to come back? Until then, you need to be sharing your faith with others who need to hear it. First Peter 3 says, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Listen, you, you don't have to tell people about church or, or my sermon or Gerald's sermon or anybody else. You know, Mark's got a great testimony of this and that, and Gerald does, and you know, Donna's got a great story of this and that. What's your story? What's the hope that's in you? And if there's no hope in you, I want to challenge you today to... To look to him, look to Jesus, because there needs to be hope in you. No matter what the circumstances look like, can you share your faith with people personally today? Can you tell someone, can you tell the waitress at lunch, if she were to ask or he were to ask, hey, why do you have hope in Jesus? I can tell you came from church, so what's your hope? Are you going to go, well, uh, why don't you come to our church? You know, the pastor can talk to you. No. What's your hope? What's your story? What can you share with them? God put you there. He prepared you to be there. Can you share with that person today? Proverbs chapter 6. This is one of those weird kind of scriptures a little bit. It says, Go to the ant, O sluggard, consider her ways, and be wise. Without having any chief officer or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. What has that got to do with anything? Well, this is honestly just a life lesson. Whether you believe in Jesus or God or not, are you preparing in your life? Parents, I want to ask you something. Are you preparing your children for the future? Some of us are grandparents. Are we helping as best we can, as, as the parents will let us, preparing our grandchildren for their future? Are we sharing our faith with them, but are we also teaching them how to budget? And not waste money on stupid things. Are we teaching them that? Are we preparing them? Because if not, that's our responsibility. I'm sorry. It really is. We need to prepare them. And I, I'm sorry. I see too many parents that are just trying to be their children's buddies. God called you to parent them. To instruct them. To raise them up. To help them, yes. But to teach them. And sometimes those lessons are hard, aren't they? Prepare them for life. Proverbs 22, 3 says, The prudent sees danger and hides himself, but the simple go on and suffer for it. Are you prepared for the future? Are you prepared for what's coming in the next year? Are you prepared for the next five years? I mean, what if Jesus doesn't come back for a few years? Are you preparing for the future and preparing your children for that? Some of you, you believe and know that God has called you to something that you haven't started yet. I know many people that feel like they're called into ministry, they don't know what to do. A lot of people I hear talk about they want to start a business, maybe a project. We, we over this past year, built a house. We're still working on the house a lot. You have to prepare for those things as well. Are you prepared and preparing? 
Luke chapter 14, verse 28 says, For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost whether he has enough to complete it. You've got to count the cost. If you're going to go into ministry, I, I just want to say this to you. If you feel like God has called you into ministry, you need to count the cost. A lot of times I talk to a lot of young guys that just say, man, I just feel like God's called me into ministry. I, I want to go do this and I want to start a church and do that. And I'm like, you need to finish school and study, and get into God's Word, do all that stuff before you ever even think about doing any of that stuff. And do the little things first. Be an usher, be a greeter, get work for guest services, go help in the children's ministry for a few months, you know. Get your feet wet. You need to be prepared to do ministry because there's a lot of things that happen in church and in other ministries that you just don't know until you get into it. And the, the, the statistics of pastors that make it in from seminary to full-time ministry, it's like 2%. Like 2% of seminary students actually stay in ministry their entire life. I mean, that's just enough to tell us it's hard, isn't it? And you go, well, you know, my job's hard too. I'm just telling you, we need to be prepared. Count the cost. Probably the most important preparation you need to do is to be prepared for eternity. Whether Jesus comes back in my lifetime or not, we're all on a death sentence. We're all going to die one day. And I, honestly, for me, I hope, I hope I never die. I hope Jesus comes back before I die and before Donna dies. And, but quite honestly, you know, it could happen at any moment. But we're getting towards the end of our finish line too. Are you prepared for eternity? Have you trusted Christ? Have you truly repented of your sins and turned to him? Acts twenty two sixteen says, now, why do you wait? Why do you wait? You know it. You know the truth. You've been going to church long enough. Why do you wait? Rise and be baptized. Wash away your sins calling on his name. I hear people in the church all the time throw around the word seasons. You know, it's just not my season. It's this season or that season. Ecclesiastes uh, talked about that. There's a long list. You can put it up there, but I'm not reading all that. Uh, that Solomon said there's a time for everything. There's just a time for everything. And there are seasons in life. But I believe that in every season of your life, no matter where you are in life, God has been preparing you for where you are right now. And he is preparing you right now for where he's about to take you. And are you, are you going to be open to what he wants to do in the future? And that could be next week, six months, a year from now, five years from now. Are you prepared? Are you up, open to letting God prepare you for what he wants you to do? And God does prepare us. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says, We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I love the, the New Living Translation says that we are God's masterpiece. We're God's masterpiece. And God painted this picture, and it's you. Psalm 139 says that he knew us before we were ever born, that when we were a mother's wombs, God wove us together in the intricate parts of our lives and our bodies and everything about us so intimately that he knew us before we were ever born. God thinks we are awesome. Isn't that nice? Isn't that great to know that God loves us so much that he just thinks we're his masterpiece? That, that I just, I've always thought of it this way. We have uh, pictures of our grandkids, you know, all over the house and, and on the refrigerator or whatever. And I just think God's just got our pictures. You know, maybe that's a terrible theology, really, but, but that he just thinks of us all the time. Psalm 139 says that his thoughts about us never stop. He is continually thinking about us, me, you. Right now, God is thinking about you and honestly trying to communicate to you because he loves us that much. I want to talk about ministry for just for a minute, and then we're just going to, we're going to close up here in just a minute. If God has called you, and he has, he wants to use you, but there are three things that I want you to understand, misunderstandings about ministry. One is that ministry is only for people who work on staff at the church. That is so far from the truth. That is so far from the truth. Can I tell you something that I've said many times and I want you to hear it again? Would you look, just look up here for a minute and I just want you to hear this. If you're a follower of Christ, if you're a Christian, born again, whatever words you like to use, 
you are in full-time ministry. You may not be getting paid, but you are in full-time ministry. There is no part-time. In the past, in this church, we have people that are part-time, and I so hate that. That's talking about the hours, quite honestly. It's part-time because you don't have to work 40 hours a week at the church. But I'm telling you, every one of us is full-time. And if you have any other perspective, you're not ready for ministry. Significant ministry just happens. Not true at all. You have to be intentional. You have to be open. You have to be looking. God, who can I talk to today? Who are you sending me to? Who are you putting in, in my path today? I, I may think this is just a random meeting. I just, oh, suddenly i got to go to the store. But you run into somebody, and before you know it, you're having a conversation about something going on in their life. It, it doesn't just happen. You have to be intentional about it. The third misconception or misunderstanding is you can't minister until you're perfect. Do I really need to even address that one? I wouldn't think so because we all know the Bible is just stock full of people that were all imperfect and all of us are imperfect and every person you've ever known that's done ministry was imperfect. Billy Graham was imperfect. Mother Teresa, imperfect. Every one of us, I'm imperfect, you are, you know. Remember the old commercial, I'm a pep pepper, you're a pepper, don't you want to be a de- pepper too or whatever, Dr. Pepper, wasn't that what it is? Just look around and say, I'm imperfect, you're in pepper, don't you want to be imperfect too? I mean, you know, it's just we're all imperfect. It's just the way it is. God wants to use you now. Right now, where you are, and he'll continue to mold you and make you better. One of the things that he does to to prepare us that we really hate is discipline. Hebrews 12, 11 says, For the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. I'll be honest with you. Wednesday night I talked about a little story between me and Donna and how God really whipped me. I don't know if you've ever been whipped by God. It's, it's tough whipping. I, got, I was raised by my mother. My dad when I was, died when I was four. But I'm telling you, my dad could not have hit with a leather belt any harder than my mama did. And I mean, it wasn't just a leather belt. It was a leather strap. It, it wasn't just a belt you put around. It was a strap. I'm not kidding. That wide. It, it looked like one of those things that you sharpen knives with. I'm telling you, that thing. And she'd fold that thing over. And she'd reach back to California. Wham. I'm telling you. But I needed every one of them. Every, every time. Some of you don't believe in it. I get it. We, we realize, we understand, we can tell that you don't believe in it. But I, I'm just saying, <laughs> sorry. That wasn't for anybody here. That was for, that was for those watching online. But I'm just saying, <laughs> just kidding. I'm just kidding. I need Rebecca to get a kick out of that. But sometimes God loves us. If he didn't love us, he would discipline us. He'd just say, go your own way because you're just going off the cliff and I'm just going to let you go. But he loves us. He doesn't want us to go down that road. Don't you as parents love your kids and you grandparents love your grandkids so much that you don't want them to go through the things you went through, right? That's why we tell them. That's why we try to discipline them because we know we've been down that road. God can see the road we're going down. He's going, don't go down that road. It's not going to end well for you. So three things I want to give you, three points. I'm actually going to do a three-point sermon today, and then we're going to close. Corey, if you want to come up. First thing is, he makes us wait. God makes us wait. This is so hard, isn't it? This is so hard. But I, but I want you to understand something. This is not a passive waiting. This is not just sitting in your recliner and saying, whenever you show up, God, I, I'm going to be sitting here. This is active. The word waiting in the Scripture quite honestly means trust, active trust. You are, you are working, you are doing something, you're pursuing Him, you're pursuing your calling, you're pursuing what God has for you to do. It's not just sitting around waiting. But everybody God has placed in, in great regard, He has put in a season of waiting. Think about Moses. Forty years walking around the desert. Forty years waiting for the promise of God. What about, what about David as a shepherd, anointed, going to be the king of Israel, and he can, just goes back into the field and becomes, you know, still being a shepherd? Years he had to wait. The apostle Paul waited 14 years before he was established in the church. 14 years. I think probably the hardest one is the story of Abram. The story of Abram, you all know it. He was promised, him and his wife Sarah were promised a child and that he would be a father of great nations. 
And God showed up and said, you're going to be a father of great nations. It's not going to be the way you thought. It's going to come from you. And first year, no baby. Second year, no baby. Third year, no baby. Fourth, fifth, sixth year, no baby. Seventh year, no baby. Eight years, no baby. God, did you really say that? 25 years. Abram's had his name changed already at Abraham, the father of great nations. And, and, you know, it's like, this is funny to me because it's like anytime they introduce him, what's your name? My name is father of great nations. Oh, you got a lot of kids. Nope, don't have one. But he trusted the promise of God. 25 years. Second thing that God does is he gives us great gifts. You all have a gift. God's given you talents and skill. And you might think it's of no use to God. Can I tell you, if you can operate a computer, we can use you at 11 o'clock today. We need help in the sound booth, in the media booth. We need people to rotate, helping those guys so they can have a Sunday off and enjoy the service. God can use you. You have gifts that he can use right now. And you may say, well, my gifts, I don't see where my gifts can be used now, but you just hang on. God will open up the opportunity. The third thing is he sends us signs. It's not a coincidence that that psalm has been on your mind for weeks and suddenly you're put in the place of talking to somebody that's gone through a tragedy and needs to hear that God is my refuge, my ever-present hope in the time of trouble. It's not a coincidence that you went through something and now suddenly you're talking to somebody that they're telling your story. God wants to use you. That's God telling you. I ask you to stand and we're going to close by taking communion and we're going to do something a little bit different. But here's what I want you to understand. God is preparing you for something. And you might say, I I don't want to wait. I can't see the value in waiting. Do you understand that God chose to prepare Jesus 30 years for three and a half years of ministry. The Son of God prepared 30 years for three and a half years of ministry. Who are we to think that we need any less preparation? Now that, you might say, well, there's my out. I don't have to do anything for 30 years. No, 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 no. That's not what that means. God has been preparing you. And He's going to take you from place to place to place. And every time He's going to prepare you for the next thing and, and I have hope and I hope you do in this scripture 1 Corinthians 2 says what no eye has seen nor ear heard nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him we have no idea the magnitude of what God has done is doing in our lives and what is going to happen what God has prepared for us is beyond description because he's a loving father that loves you more than you could ever imagine we're going to close by taking communion but I'm going to ask you to do something a little bit different today we always do this at 9.30. We take, take communion, take a piece of the bread, take a cup of the juice. Hopefully we have enough today. We've got a lot of folks. But here's what I'd like to ask you to do. Lane's got some more. Of course, she's prepared. Here's what I'd like to ask you to do without drawing a lot of attention to it. We all know that our country is in a mess, isn't it? Right? doesn't matter where you stand on the political side of things or, or anything like that. It really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what your past is. You may have been in a place where, where you had an abortion or you know somebody had an abortion, um, whatever. This is not what that's about. But what we know is our country is in a mess. And God needs to intervene in our country. I don't know that uh, Gerald and Cheryl and I we, we were talking about this not long ago I'm not sure that the United States is mentioned in scripture in the end times but we're here now we are God's ambassadors it's our place to intercede for our nation so I'm going to ask you as you come and take the communion would you, would you come to the altar and just pray for our nation as you do that however God leads you to do that would you do that today just together that we could be unified in that one thing for this little time. Sound good? Is that okay? All right. Father, we thank you for 
your word. We thank you for what you have done and continue to do. And Lord, I know, I know because your word is so clear and so full that you are preparing us. You have been preparing us. Some of us have already been through things and you've already used us, and, and, but you, you're moving us from place to place to place. God, whatever you have prepared us for, I pray that you help us walk in it right now in your spirit, in boldness, in your truth. But God, also know that at this moment you are preparing us for other things to come as well. And God, today we're going we're to come together for the next few minutes as this body of your believers is Christ on behalf of our nation. We're going to intercede and stand in the gap for our nation, God. And Father, we just don't want to take it for granted. We understand that nothing is impossible with you. You can do anything. So Lord, I pray that as we take the juice and as we take this bread, that we were reminded of what you did for us, Jesus, your sacrifice, your body broken for us, your blood poured out for us for our forgiveness so we can be redeemed. And Lord, I believe that you can redeem this nation still. And I pray that as we come together, things will move, something will change, that other people around the nation, other churches, other bodies around the nation will join together and, and, and that you will hear those prayers and begin to move and shape things in our nation for the kingdom of God. I pray all this in Jesus of your sacrifice. Come as you feel led. God, we honor you today. We honor you, Jesus. Knowing that there's nothing we can do without you. With you, nothing is impossible. Lord, I pray that you would help us apply what we have heard to our hearts today. We would begin to let you con continue the process of preparing us for what you have. And those, those of us, God, that have not been doing what you've called us to do, give us the courage to start today. Just to start. And God, we believe that you have a plan. And we trust you. We just trust you. Lord, I thank you for what you're going to do in this place, in this next service that we have here today. I believe it's going to be special and powerful. I believe there are going to be children upstairs that are going to be moved to turn their lives over to you. God, I believe there are going to be adults in this room that will be changed forever for the King of Kings. God, give us courage and wisdom to know exactly what we are supposed to do and to do it. We love you and we praise you. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. All right, we'll see you Wednesday night for worship night. Have a great day.